The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, hello, everybody. Now, welcome to our February 2024 webinar on what's new in our latest CAM products, uh, RhinoCAM 2024 and Visual Cat CAM 2024. Uh, the products were officially released yesterday, and so they are ready for downloads and uh, evaluation, and if you're eligible for uh, the 2024 license, your license should all already have been updated, and so you should be able to download the product from our website. Anyway, today we're just going to be going over what's new in the CAM product. And um, uh, But before we get started, uh, some notes, uh, some housekeeping tips. Uh, you can use your chat window for questions, as always. Uh, question and answers as time permits, and we like to keep it as interactive as possible. So you can just fire off your questions as the webinar is proceeding, and we will do our best to answer and stop and demo things if it's something's not unclear, or it's not clear, rather. Uh, and then uh, recording of this webinar will be made available after a couple of days, and we will send it out to all the registrants. Uh, uh, my name is Joe Anand. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the project manager here at Microsoft, and I'll be joined today by Don LaCourse, our support manager, who's actually going to do the show and tell as well as a demo. Uh, the agenda for today, we're just going to be going over all the various um, you know, highlights of the products. These are the major enhancements we, that we think we need to be highlighted. Uh, we'll start out with the usability enhancements of the product, uh, talk about posting order changes in the product, uh, save and load post enhancements. Uh, then uh, we'll go into hole making enhancements uh, and specifically five axis drilling method that has been added, a new method has been added. And then we also talk about changes in the two axis machining methods, uh, laser tools has, has been added, allows you to do laser uh, machining operations. Uh, neg negative offsets and face-off, uh, it's a, some minor enhancement in the face-off operation. And then uh, three-axis machining, uh, high-speed machining, uh, which is a really nice uh, enhancement to the facing toolpath. In fact, this high-speed machining enhancement also percolates its way down to the two-axis machining as well. So that's a pretty, uh, really nice uh, enhancement uh, for people machining hard materials. Uh, then for mold makers, uh, this might be of interest. Tool contact condition has been added for surface-based machining, and Don is going to be spending uh, some time on that and showing the toolpath differences in the toolpaths. And then exact Z-level distances have also been added. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about four-axis machining changes, and, and then five-axis machining, uh, some minor changes there as well, and then finally licensing changes. So. Without any further delay, Don, do you want to take over? Okay. Hello, everyone. Glad you could join us this morning. Um, we're real excited to uh, release our 2024 uh, product, and uh, I think you're going to like uh, what you see. Let's start out with the usability uh, enhancements. Uh, as Joe mentioned, if we're, I'm going to start on the left and work my over to, way over to the right. Um, we implemented... Uh, posting order based on tool numbers. So um, previously, uh, users would have to jiggle around their their uh, cam operations based on the tools if they, you know, wanted to minimize the number of tool changes. Uh, well, now you don't have to do that. It will sort uh, for you based on the uh, options we see here. So, you, uh, post based on the order that they currently appear in the machining job. And then you can post by increasing or decreasing uh, order of the tool number. And then below that, we also uh, added um, the ability to, to always load and save uh, the post with the file. Um, there's been a lot of um, uh, user uh, support questions about post. Uh, my post is missing uh, or it's different. It's not posting right. Um, these two options will ensure that you have the post uh, with the pile that it belongs with the pile and it uh, never gets changed uh, based on any other parameter. So that's, that's a good option right there. And uh, in the middle, uh, as I mentioned, the post priority, uh, you can uh, change that. And then if we look over to the right, uh, when you actually post 
uh, a machining job with the uh, tool priority uh, enabled, uh, it'll alert you at the top and then actually post based on uh, the T numbers, T1, T2, T3, et cetera. Now, we did add um, the ability to drill in five axis, which is pretty exciting. Um, previously, you could only drill, I guess, would be indexed five axis operations where you'd, you know, lock the, uh, the uh, plane uh, in place and then do your drilling. Now you, you can do it actually in five axis. So that was a good, uh, good enhancement there. If any questions, uh, just put them in the uh, questions uh, area and we'll answer them. Now, for three axis enhancements, um, this is a pretty good enhancement here. If you look at where the arrows are, we're looking at horizontal roughing, and we're looking at the uh, clearance plane tab in the cut transfer method. So the um, clearance plane definition in this example is set to automatic. Uh, and then below that, we have the cut transfer method set to skim, but we've also added a checkbox here to include uh, the in-process stock in the, in the calculation of the skim clearance. So if you look at the arrows over here, you'll see that uh, in the areas where the tool had to transverse above the part, it applied the skim clearance to the highest uh, position on the part, but if it didn't have to span over the part, it calculated the skim clearance based on the cut level. Uh, so if you see these small uh, retracts right here and over here, uh, that's what happens when you have this checkbox checked. Uh, this uh, just an enhancement to help you uh, maximize your uh, machining time. Uh, if you have a rather complex part, as you can as you can imagine or may have run into, there's a lot of retracts up to the full clearance uh, when it didn't need to be. Oh, uh, another note. Uh, actually, the uh, in previous releases we were looking at the part geometry, only the part geometry, and we computed the uh, skim clearance. Uh, so uh, what Don is saying is absolutely correct in that uh, the skim clearance moves will reduce uh, your moves all the way up to the retract plane and thereby enabling faster machining. Uh, but what this enhancement does is it actually also introduces the in-process stock in the computation. So if you had a roughing operation done previously and there were chunks of stock in where uh, you have the arrow that Don, on this picture, Let's say there was actually an in-process stock uh, on the way. In previous releases, uh, the system would have ignored the in-process stock and actually collided with the in-process stock. Now what, what it does is actually takes into consideration the in-process stock and it would retract to the correct distance to avoid the in-process stock as well. So yeah, not only are you getting uh, better, higher speeds in machining, but also much safer speeds now uh, since the in-process talk is being considered. Yep. Thanks, yep. Don. Okay. Now here, um, this is a, a relatively minor enhancement, but it does uh, contribute to uh, maximizing uh, the efficiency and the and the time required to do machining. Uh, what we what you're seeing here is the face two axis face top operation where the tool is just uh, facing the top uh, of the part uh, based on uh, the highest level of the part. So as you can see over here on the right, we have a, a face mill and it's just tra traversing left and right across the top of the part. Well, previously, um, the tool would go all the way past the part and clear, uh, you know, the edge of the part. Well, you don't really, if the tool is sufficiently uh, large enough, or even regardless of what size the tool is, you can now uh, bring that tool in closer uh, to the part by entering a negative value in the cut area extension. So if you look at the dialog, uh, the icon right here in the dialog, um, what this operation does is it adds distances to the maximum size of the part and the stock. So previously you could only add values or add distance uh, 
to the toolpath, move it out, but you could never move it in. So now you can enter a negative value here, uh, and that'll tighten up your toolpath and save you a little bit of time. Now also, uh, as Joe mentioned, we uh, enhance the high-speed machining and two-and-a-half axis spacing. Uh, so not only do you have the um, high-speed toolpaths at the cut level, but you also now have the high-speed uh, entries at the entry and exit level. So you can see these arc motions right here where the arrows are pointing to. Uh, so it adds a high-speed entry at each cut level and a an high-speed exit, as well as the high-speed path itself. Now this one, uh, I like this one as well because previously, um, if you may have run into this, if you're doing uh, three axis horizontal uh, finishing, uh, you didn't always have exact control over the distance between the cut levels. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, it calculated the overall distance and then uh, over, overall cut depth and then divided that by, uh, you know, the maximum Distance and then it would fluctuate in between that. And I know I oh, probably re, messed that the, up a little bit, Joe. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so what the system was doing before was uh, using uh, the step-down control distance and computing integral number of cuts between the uh, the top and the bottom Z levels. Uh, so you would always get a cut at the top and you would always get a cut at the bottom. And uh, this way, you know, and, and you would get, obviously, it's integral number of cuts, so to ensure that you would get a cut at the top at the bottom. And since um, this requirement actually forced the system to recompute the actual step-down distance to be uh, slightly smaller in many cases than the actually specified distance. Some users, what they wanted is they didn't want us to want the system to actually change that distance at all. They wanted these cut levels to be exactly as they specified. Uh, when you, and in the 2024 version, you can do that. But um, the problem with that, obviously, is you will not get a cut level at the bottom most cut. So, you know, that's the trade-off here. So, but in some situations, uh, the exact cut levels uh, are, are important customers. So that's why we added this enhancement. Yeah, and also look, just look at these two images. The one on the right is in version 23, where the cut levels uh, didn't fall exactly at the depth that the user specified. In this case, which is a distance of one millimeter. Uh, if you look at this uh, example part, it's just a stack, uh, topographical stack of surfaces at one in, at one millimeter intervals. So now you can actually set the distance at one and check this box here and it'll maintain exactly that distance as you can see over here under the 2024 uh, uh, image right here. Now this is one that uh, goes to uh, uh, my heart specifically because um, I've always felt that we needed better um, uh, contact conditions for mold makers, um, specifically around uh, the parting lines. And in version 23, um, the default uh, condition was the on condition, meaning that uh, the I'm going to show this a little bit better in the in the part file demo. But uh, in the on condition, the tool axis in the tip of the tool, when it aligned itself with the uh, perimeter curve that you're machining, it, it would stop. And for cavity, uh, you know, parts that have cavities, the tool is actually rolling up over uh, the party line, which is a big, big no no. Uh, tool makers do not like to see that tool uh, ride that parting line. Uh, so in 24, we added a new condition called the contact. So whenever the uh, the tip, uh, if, for example, if you're using a ball mill, whenever the uh, the machining ball of the of the tool makes contact with that uh, perimeter edge of the surface, it stops. Uh, and then starts going, you know, in the reverse direction or where, or where it's supposed to go uh, opposite that direction. Uh, so just if you look in this, these uh, simulations, uh, you'll see that down below in previous versions, the tool was riding up on the parting line and actually um, messing up 
uh, the parting line. And you would see that uh, in your actual molded parts, which is not good. So on top, we see the 2024 contact condition, nice clean uh, cut around the parting line. Uh, previously, in order to get that, we actually uh, added masking surfaces or guide surfaces to help guide the tool past uh, the parting line. Now you don't have to do that for a specific set uh, of cavities. So I'm going to show this as well. Now also, uh, we allowed you to uh, machine and change the the rotational axis of four axis machining to the positive Z and negative Z axis. For instance, in this dialog over here in the machining dialog, we have the um, machine set to five axis, uh, but we have the fourth axis rotation set to plus C or minus C, and check this box down here to use that uh, for the four axis machining operations. Uh, previously, you know, we did not support uh, the rotational axis in the plus or minus uh, Z axis of the part. Now this one here, you know, it's a relatively, well, I would say relatively minor enhancement, but it, it comes in really handy if you're doing indexed uh, five axis operations. So you see this, this part over here on the right, uh, we do some index machining and each one of the setups here uh, is an indexed uh, position and five axis. So, what we've added is the ability to recalculate the angles that the tool would take in order to get from uh, each of these fixed uh, positions. And that's we added that without the uh, need to recalculate the entire machining job. So uh, a quick clarification, I think uh, Don said tool, but it's uh, really the machine tool. Uh, the angles, the axes angles of the machine tool is what okay. uh, he's talking about. Uh, so, and that happens, uh, the reason we would need that is if you reorder the operations inside of a setup, uh, the machine angles are not automatically recomputed because they're computed only when you do the simulation of the tool pack. Uh, so, but when you post it, if the machine angles are incorrectly incorrect from the previous I'm sorry, incorrectly inherited from the previous operation, you might have a problem uh, because the tool might collide with something along the way. So that's why we've added this uh, enhancement to make sure that the angles are all coherent going from one operation to another. As they appear in the machining job, all right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, uh, this one, Joe, you want to take over and talk about the licensing enhancements? But, um, so we've enhanced uh, the licensing uh, for network licensing. This is typically for larger commercial uh, instances as well as uh, educational institutes. Uh, so we have added this uh, interface, new interface around what we had, the network lock license manager or the license server application. And uh, this makes it a lot easier for, um, you know, IT, uh, IT people to actually install our network lock license on their on their systems, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, are we going to be talking about this later, Don? Or uh, I think we do have a slide where you take over and talk about it. If you okay, yeah, we'll talk later then after okay. your demo. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's our last slide. Let's take a look at some parts that. Uh, highlight the various uh, enhancements. So let's go, we're going to talk about first the posting order and the save load post um, uh, enhancements on the um, uh, CAM preferences dialog. So we're going to look at this one right here. Um, if we look at the operations that we have in the machine job, if you look at down here at the, below at the base here, you'll see the actual tool number. Um, and if you go through these uh, operations, you'll see that we have uh, a tool num starts with tool number two, uh, and then number four, uh, and another number four, and then a number one, uh, et cetera. So these are not, the tools are not in order. They're ordered based on how um, the user uh, programmed the part, okay? So they didn't necessarily think about the tool order. I mean, you can, as you know, as you go along, 
you know, think about that and reorder them yourself. But you don't have to do that now. Uh, now you can uh, go into the camp preferences dialog and go to the post processing tab. And you'll see that we added uh, two new sections at the bottom of the post processor tab of the camp preferences dialog where you have um, options for the posting order you can uh, or you can refer to this to posting priority by tool number so uh, three options first you can just leave it the way they're uh, uh, you know located in the machining job and it'll just post out in that uh, order or now you can actually uh, post based on ascending and descending tool number so what it would do is it would ignore the order that they're uh, located in the machining job and then post them based on the tool number. So let's go ahead and just show you that uh, real quick. But let's talk about this bottom one first before we do that. Um, we have two additional options here for saving your post. Now, um, previously, uh, there were cases where the users post in a specific file, uh, say it's an older file, it may have uh, the post may have been changed, okay, in that file when you load it and based on maybe a, a, a post that you have defined uh, either in your template or however. It may, there's conditions where it may have changed. Uh, here you can check these boxes and always maintain the post, the version of the post and the post itself based on the file and it will always stay with the file. Uh, regardless, you get these two checkboxes. Regardless, when loading and saving, that post always stays with the file. So let's pick OK there, and let's just post this. So you see, um, OK, this looks like I didn't actually set the posting order. Let's go in and set that. OK, so let's post based by increasing tool number. So we'll start at the lowest tool number and work its way up. Let's post that again. Okay, so you'll see at the top it says uh, post order is set to tool number ascending. So what it did was it rearranged the operations as they appear in the G-code file and actually is based on the tool numbers if you uh, to find, let's look at T, T1. So the first with T1, and then we'll just go to T2. As you can see, it just arranged them in, in the tool number order. And you can uh, reverse that order, obviously, uh, in, from the options in the camp preferences dialog. So you don't have to mess with it. You don't have to rearrange it. You can do it uh, from the post itself, which is a good, uh, good time-saving enhancement. So let's go to, um, so we covered the posting order. We covered the save and load of the post with the file. Let's take a look at five axis drilling. So here we just have an example um, part where we have um, holes that we need to drill at various locations uh, on this uh, um, globe as you say a half globe okay so previously if you wanted to um you know drill you would have to drill an index five axis operations meaning you'd have to index uh the setup on this face so that the z axis is normal to the face and then do a two axis drilling operation well that obviously gets kind of tedious if you have a lot of different orientations that you need to drill now uh you can just go into the holes and you have an option for five axis drilling. So let's just open this up a little bit. So now um, you can uh, select the point, the drill points itself, and select the underlying surface that you're gonna stay normal to. In this case, it's actually underneath um, the outer shell. As you see, it's this surface right here. OK, so the tool drilling tool is always going to stay normal to that surface. And then the rest of the dialog is nearly identical to two and a half axis drilling. Uh, where you set your, your drilling type and all the parameters for each type of drilling. Uh, and then you also have um, uh, gouge checking uh, 
capability like in other 5-axis operations, uh, and you can also do sorting uh, in 5-axis. So that comes in handy if you have a lot of holes uh, that you need to drill um, normal to an irregular surface, and if you're in the premium 5-axis configuration, now you can do that uh, with the 5-axis hole making. So next, let's take a look at, that was 5-axis drilling, let's take a look at some of the 2-axis uh, laser and negative offsets and face-off operations. Let's take a look at this part right here. Now, first of all, let's just go into the tool tab. We have added a tool over here on the end uh, for uh, laser cutting. So it's basically just uh, a definition of the laser uh, cutting portion of the laser. Now you don't have to use uh, typically, and before now, we would basically just use a, a regular flat mill, you know, and just specify based on the size, you know, of the laser uh, path. Now you don't have to do that. You can define an actual laser tool. The other uh, advantage of having the laser tool is, you know, the parameters uh, on the right side where you have the Pierce uh, dwell power and units, uh, things of that nature can be defined and associated with the tool and transferred to your post. So it comes out, the post-processed output is correct. Mm -hmm. So that's why this tool has been added. Now let's go into the actual uh, face top. So if you look at this, you see that we allowed you to enter a negative value here for the extension of the tool uh, past uh, the stock. So previously, these were only positive numbers, so you can only extend it out. You couldn't extend it back. Uh, so this allows you to save some machining time. And let's go to just run through this. Let's cancel that. Let's just take a look at it. So previously, the tool would extend out past where the edge of the base mill was actually nearer to the edge of the part. So all this extension out here was really just wasting machining time. Now you can enter negative values and tighten up that tool path and bring the tool in closer uh, to the part uh, as you see fit. And to just run that past it. And the same applies on both sides or both ends. Let's take a look at this one. As you can see, by default, it was way out there on the left uh, and the right. Okay, it's a different tool, but you get the idea. With the tool path is extended uh, way out uh, to the right and the left. So that's a pretty good enhancement. So let's go, uh, we did the laser tools, we did the negative offsets. Let's take a look at some three axis enhancements. The first one, we're gonna look at uh, high speed uh, machining and facing. So let's take a look at uh, where is it over here? So if you look here, we've got a facing operation, and then we have. Uh, can you, uh, Don, can you show the existing uh, the 2023 version first, so people get an idea okay. of what's changed? Yeah, yeah, we can move that up if you want. Okay, so. Previously, 23, uh, the, the uh, high-speed machining path or the pattern was only applied at the cut level. It wasn't applied to the entrance or the exit or the transfers from, not transfers, but the movement of the tool, you know, to uh, another offset position. You would get a sharp area in here, which is hard on the tool, hard on your machine. You would actually... In some cases, uh, if you have a, a lighter router, you would actually uh, feel that jerking motion as that tool goes around that, that sharp corner. Well, now uh, it actually adds uh, high-speed arc motions to the entries and the exits, as well as the transitions uh, in the pattern itself. So, so it, you're, you're getting both 2D arc uh, fitting as well as 3D arc fitting as well, so yep. which is you know, very new to the system. We've mm -hmm. never done 3D arcs uh, before, so this is pretty new. Yep, yep. 
and uh, you'll really see that uh, you'll see that enhancement just by watching the, the tool in, in a case such as this. Okay, so that was the um, one of the three axes, I guess, considered a three axis. So let's take a look at the contact conditions. I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, on this. Uh, our time is pretty good. If you've got any questions, uh, be sure to just put them in the questions box and we'll get to them. So let's look at first um, tool contact conditions. So what I've got here, I've got two identical cavities. Okay. And I've got operations up here. In in previous versions, if you wanted to machine this uh, cavity, the default position for the tool was the on condition, whether you used the, um, the containment regions tab or the part surfaces tab, uh, the default uh, was on. You only had on, to, and past. Well, what happens with that is you didn't have any options to control that tool at the actual parting line. So in this case, uh, when I do the simulation, you'll see it. the tool starts actually ramping up over the parting line, which is pretty bad. So in the, uh, we've added a new condition uh, called contact, where the tool stops when any portion of the machining uh, ball of the tool makes contact with the surface perimeter curve or edge, it will stop. So let's, to get a good idea of that, let's go ahead and simulate this real quick. So I'm going to do uh, simulate this. Sorry about that. Okay, let's change this to mop. Turn the toolpath off. So there's our uh, roughing. Let's go ahead and make some changes here to the uh, stock. Let's turn these off. Let's turn this to that. Click OK. OK. So there's our uh, horizontal roughing operation. Um, so previously, and this, this is the first parallel finishing where we just had the default on condition, okay? And let's go ahead and simulate that. Okay, well, that's, the, that's just to clear it. So that's not the actual cavity. So let's do the cavity here. So this is the default on uh, condition. Um, based on the cavity, which is selected as the control geometry, and the perimeter of the cavity is actually the parting line. So you can really get an idea of how the parting line is violated uh, based on the tool, the, the axis of the tool aligning itself on the perimeter uh, of the cavity. And as you can see, the tool rides up over the cavity and this is all flash in your actual part. If you if you uh, molded this part, you would see flash in these areas because that parting line uh, was uh, violated. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the uh, part on the right with the contact surface condition. Select the two surfaces. Con uh, the Contact is set to the surface extent condition is set to contact. Let's go ahead and simulate that. So now you can really appreciate the simulation. I mean, no uh, violation of the uh, parting line. Uh, when the let's go ahead and go to the uh, multi viewport. I just want to uh, clarify a little bit, uh, Don. Yeah, the choice of words violation might be a little harsh because well, when you're a toolmaker, uh, that is a, that's a violation <laughs> because I mean, you go, well, I want to from a system uh, perspective, I want to say in the previous operation, <laughs> uh, the system is maintaining everything within tolerance. So even though it's riding that uh, edge, uh, everything is within tolerance. But you know, when you actually machine and the tool is actually touching it, yeah, you're going to have some sort of uh, blemishes in the part, which is what uh, Don is terming violation that I'm taking objection to. So anyway, thanks. Okay, well, uh, just a clarification there. Uh, Joe mentioned that everything is within tolerance. The problem with that is when a tool touches the parting line more than once, a tolerance is applied. So if you're applying a tolerance when it touches the first time, then you're applying a tolerance that touches the second time, uh, that's a, a tolerance stack, which can come out uh, 
to be a violation or uh, undercut or an overcut uh, of the actual uh, uh, parting line. So if you're contacting more than twice, you can just imagine you're you're just going back over that parting line, going back over the parting line, the same point on the parting line, it degrades the parting line. So that's why uh, if you see uh, pictures of uh, molded parts, uh, this happens a lot in prototype parts where you're not really trying to be exact you know, just for the prototype, uh, you'll see a lot of flashing, you'll see mismatching of the parting line, and all that's because the tool um, had its way with the parting line when it cut, and that's a big no-no in, in cutting cavities for uh, mold making. So what I was going to do here is I was just going to show you, uh, let's turn the path on, and let's change this to, just do it to the wireframe. Okay, and let's just run that tool. Let's just run it down there. Okay, so let's go back over to the very, okay, so let's go on down where it, right towards the middle. Okay, that's pretty close. So you'll see that right there, the ball of the tool made contact, or pretty close, made contact to the perimeter of the surface, the actual cavity, and that is the parting line. So once it touches that parting line, uh, the tool stops and reverses in the other direction. That's why you see that it's not really covering all of the cavity, but in fact it is. Uh, the path is only calculated based on the tip of the tool. But that entire cavity is being machined very precisely and not, uh, you know, going over that parting line back and forth as it was uh, in the on condition. Now, we also have another part lined up for this, which shows this as well. Um, you may have seen this this, ca this uh, mold cavity. We use that in a lot of different uh, uh, cases to show different things. Well. If you look at this cavity, uh, you have um, a lot of um, uh, contoured surfaces in the cavity itself. And with the on condition, you'll see that the tool actually rides uh, all the way up. Let's go to here. You'll see that the tool is riding all the way up. Any of this arc, you see this arcing motion right here? That's where the tool is riding uh, on a specific surface edge. So if we go to the contact condition, you'll see that it doesn't ride. When that tool comes up and it touches that uh, surface perimeter curve, uh, it will stop and then reverse in the other direction. Now, in this, in this case, you know, this is not the actual parting line. Uh, it's calculated based on the edge of this fillet. Uh, but even so, you could, you know, be doing this fillet with a different operation and this may be a critical area uh, on the mode itself. So you don't want that tool, you know, to constantly ride that edge. So now uh, you have very precise control over the tool uh, at uh, the perimeter uh, of the surface, uh, which is in fact the parting line. So that's, I mean, I, I don't want to underestimate this enough because or overestimate this enough because this is really a big deal uh, for mold makers. So if you got any mold makers that are watching, uh, you understand how uh, how important this is. So let's say so we uh, put about 10 minutes on that one. We're having pretty good on time. So if you guys got any questions, um, go ahead and uh, put them in the questions bar. And it looks like we're going to have time at the end to cover those. So what are we going to do? We're going to talk about another three-axis enhancement, um, uh, calling it exact Z-level um, uh, distances. And da -dum, da -dum. let's take a look at, so this was the cut transfer um, method where we mentioned where the, let's go into this and look at the actual clearance plane. So in the clearance plane definition, uh, we have the clearance plane definition set to automatic, and then we have the cut transfer method set to skim. Well, as, as we discussed in the slide uh, previously, uh, when you set it to skim, the skim was calculated based on the maximum extents of the part, 
in the Z level. So the tool was always retracting up uh, a little bit past the part based on the skim clearance. Well, that is some wasted moves. If you're machining in an area that doesn't transverse across the part. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these um, actual, look at this by cut levels here. So we're going to just work our way down. You'll see in the, you know, at the top level, pretty much everything is based on the, uh, the cut level of the in-process stock, basically. But as you get down deeper, you'll see that the clearance, the retract clearance gets larger or more distance, higher up, I should say. It's always clearing the top of the part. Well, now if you, if we go down in some of these other, uh, cut levels, you'll see over here, it didn't need to go all the way up past the part, so the skim clearance was applied based on the in-process stock, which is the cut level, this cut level right here. So it uh, extended up, uh, skimmed the top of the cut level, okay? And you'll see that a lot in some other cases. Uh, here's another, um, another, you'll see these here. No need to extend all, no need to extend all the way up past the part in these types of conditions. So you can imagine if you have, this is a relatively simple part, a very complex part, you could virtually save, uh, minutes, if not more, uh, in the machining time by not having to retract and transfer, uh, all the way up to, uh, the skim clearance above the part. Okay. Let's look at, uh, some four axis, uh, enhancements here. So, what we're going to look at here is where we have, uh, in this case, we have a mesh uh, and the machine tool uh, for this particular part, um, the rotational axis and the fourth axis is along the Z axis. So it's up and down. Okay. Uh, previously, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, I don't believe we could actually assign the fourth axis rotation to be a positive or minus uh, no, Z. you could not. Okay. Yeah, no. could not. So you actually couldn't machine it. You would actually have to roll the part over and uh, machine it on on a machine whose rotational axis was either in the X well, or the Y. You, one way you could have done that would be to use setups and use the Z axis, uh, no, the X axis to align with the machine coordinate Z. And mm -hmm. then uh, kind of, you know, there, you had to do a lot of, uh, you know, gyrations to get what you wanted, but now it's much simpler. Mm -hmm. So if you look, if you look at this, you see this is a five axis um, machining job. Let's go look at the machine. So we got the machine set to five axis. We have the, um, the fourth uh, primary axis. Okay. So this is the fourth rotational axis. So it is now can can now be assigned to the plus C or or minus C if you look at the arrow here plus or minus Z okay um, but now we have a checkbox down here where you can actually run this in four axis mode so you can actually lock the rotational axis to the plus or minus Z okay um, and run this as a four axis operation uh, with the rotational axis running vertically uh, in the Z axis. Uh, did I miss anything on that, Joe? Is that pretty precise, what we're doing? That's fine, yeah, that's, that's a good explanation, yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, we also, that's actually the end of our parts, so we're a little bit early. If you guys got any questions, or if you want me to go back over anything, was there any questions, Joe, in the questions panel? Joe, you still with me? Okay. Sorry, I was on mute. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, yeah, the, if you just want to talk about the difference between high speed, you know, pocketing and facing a little bit, I think there's a little bit of confusion there. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back over to, uh, I guess that would be high speed pocketing facing would be this one, I guess. Mm. Yeah, go ahead and open that. And just open the parameter dialog. To, not this one, the... The high speed facing. Oh, the high speed facing. Okay, that's this one over here. Uh, where is it? There it is. Okay. Yeah, just open up the parameter dialog. Good parameters. Um, so if you look at this, the VR, this is uh, two and a half axis facing. So this high speed machining cut path has been implemented 
in two and a half axis facing, as well as in horizontal roughing. If you open up horizontal roughing, Don, uh, so we can show that. So if you go to the cut parameters tab, you'll see the core facing regions. If you select that tab, you'll see the high speed operations here. So, mm -hmm. so that, this is different from our normal pocketing high speed uh, toolpaths, which have already been in the system. So I just wanted to make that distinction. So facing is basically uh, defined as cutting from outside the material. So you have the ability to for the tool to actually come in and machine the part from outside of material. Pocketing, you cannot do it because it's uh, it's completely enclosed. So the only way you, the tool can engage into a pocket is by actually plunging or doing some sort of spiral motion to come in and do pocketing. But if you had a core region like this one, uh, the tool can come in from the outside and do the facing operation. Uh, so that is the distinction that we make in the system between core and cavities. Mm -hmm. Cavities, it's only a pure pocket. Uh, you cannot come from outside. That, that is, the tool cannot come from the outside. And so it has to plunge in or spiral in. While in facing, uh, it can actually do a 2D path and come in and, and cut it. So. This, has, this enhancement has been added uh, to the facing operations. I just wanted to make that distinction. Okay, so let's go back over here and show you that again. So you see these little blue uh, arc motions here and the uh, icon in the dialog. So it's not only adding um, arc entries, okay? It's also adding uh, connecting arc um, uh, connecting the actual offset pattern with high-speed arc. So it's it's 2D arcs on the cutting plane, and it's 3D arcs during the entry and also uh, during the exit, as you can see. Uh, let's see right here. And so yeah, and, it, and it applies applies for both two axes, two and a half axes, as well as three axes uh, machining mm -hmm. op operations. So any 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 time uh, from the beginning of the first uh, approach. Everything is high speed as far as the entries on the path itself and also the exits. So you can really, um, you know, previously, if you didn't, you know, if you previously we just, the tool just plunged down and then moves. So that was a right angle. The tool had to plunge, it had to stop, and then it had to accelerate. So if you had to do that a lot, you would actually see that uh, on the machine table actually, you know, uh, stopping and starting, stopping and starting, which is not a good thing uh, you want to see whenever you're doing a high-speed cut pattern. Was there anything else, Joe? <clears throat> uh, there were other uh, questions related to the product. I'll get to that, but let's talk about the licensing and also the five-axis enhancement. Okay. Do you want to bring up that five-axis uh, or part or uh, slide? You're talking let's about bring up the slide. Oh, the slide. Okay. Sorry. So you want to go back to five axis? You want to do, talk here or go back to five axis? Go back to five axis. Let's start with that. Yeah, okay. As far as the five axis enhancements, I think we uh, touched upon this briefly. Um, the reason uh, we do the uh, recalculate angles is if the user had changed the order of operations, it's not necessarily for setups, even if you had just one setup and you had multiple operations in it and you had changed the order of the operations by dragging and dropping, let's say. Uh, and not, and if you didn't want to redo the simulations once you reordered the toolpaths, then you had a problem because um, the five-axis machine angles uh, were all based on where the previous operation had left off. So imagine this: if uh, if you're machining something, and then you uh, retract from the the last toolpath position on the on an operation. Uh, in five-axis mode, uh, the angles of the tool, machine tool, have will be on a certain configuration. And then, um, if you want to start the next operation, then the next operation ne needs to understand where the machine tool angles were set at from the previous, at the end of the previous operation. So, if this is not uh, done correctly. Uh, then you might have uh, some random transfer moves uh, going from the previous operation to the next operation. And so this, when, when the user redoes this recalculate angles, 
it'll redo all of the machine tool angles independent of the simulation and bring them all in line so you don't have any of these random transfer moves between operations uh, in the in the event of any reordering that you had done. So it might always been a good good idea to do this uh, because you might have done some re uh, editing that uh, you'd forgotten about or uh, not aware of. So you know, and this was based on user requests. So this uh, important enhancement for Five Axis uh, customers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, and and and, and previously. Uh, you had to re I guess you had to regenerate all of your operations if you moved them around right you had to regenerate them re in order to recalculate re yeah. simulate them re simulate them so yeah. because mm -hmm. the simulation is what uh, uh, computed the angles the kinematics of the machine oh okay so. okay so now you don't have to uh, you don't have to do all that you can if you right. want to move them around you can recalculate it uh, just by uh, selecting this option uh, yeah. here okay. All right, let's move on to the licensing slide. The next one, let me talk oh, about the license. The sorry. next slide. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are not aware, that we offer basically two types of license models. Uh, one is called the, the cloud or node lock license model. Uh, this is for most commercial uh, applications. That's the license that we uh, that we provide. And for the majority of the cases, it would be a cloud license, which is pretty nice because um, once uh, you let's uh, once you get your license locked up on a machine, um, it there is a lease period associated with that license, and once that lease period expires, the license goes back into the cloud and it's immediately available for use on any other device. Uh, it's pretty nice because um, let's say you're working, we you typically work with two machines, one in your uh, office and one in, at home, and you forgot to exit the product at the office, uh, but you wanted to bring it up at home, uh, and if the lease, fired, uh, lease uh, period had expired on the license, it would be available for use on your home machine, so which is pretty nice. So even if you forgot to do it, if you're on a trip somewhere, uh, but you forgot to turn off the machine at uh, at work or exit the RhinoCam or Visual Cat Cam product at work, uh, you still have access to the license. And uh, that's the majority of the cases uh, is where we ship that cloud model. And another important feature of that model is, again, if you had a crash, let's say your machine crashed, and um, previously the the license was locked to that machine and there's no way you could recover that license because you, the hard drive crashed and the license files were written to the hard drive. Uh, but now, now with the cloud license, what happens is um, the license gets, um, gets back into the cloud uh, after the lease file period expires. So even if you had a machine crash, uh, you would have that license freed up after that lease period. And the typical lease period is actually eight hours since the first uh, access of that license. So that's a little bit about that cloud license that we ship. Uh, but what we have done here is the, the, the second license model is called the network lock license model. This is for a large commercial establishments who are running multiple licenses, as well as uh, educational institutions who are running you know, hundreds of licenses at one time. Uh, we offer this uh, product called the network uh, lock license. And we have enhanced the, the application setup, as well as the application itself. Uh, what you're seeing is the network lock license dialog that comes up once you load the uh, load the installer or run the installer and the uh, IT uh, person actually will set this up on a server that all the client machines are actually accessing and um, uh, the, the IT person will set up the license code and the port number to use and then uh, some diagnostic information will be displayed on the dialog like the service information uh, also the server machine itself where you can actually choose the IP address of the server to associate with the uh, the application so the clients can use that IP and uh, if you want to bring up the product uh, let's let, let me finish this and we'll bring okay. up the product okay. I'll talk about the IP in a bit uh, so the IP address here has to match the IP address in the client machines uh, so they can talk to each other so the client machine is actually talking to this service um, that this application launches 
and then this service is actually serving the license to the client machines. And then the things we have added is the users have some uh, problems setting up firewall rules. Now we can do that automatically by clicking on that button, uh, create firewall, firewall rule. That would be a standard Windows firewall would be set up. And then also write a reg file. We can write a reg file uh, that can be installed on client machines. So the license code is actually transparent to the users. So the clients don't ever get to see the license code. This kind of protects your license code from being shared between multiple clients. So in case of theft or you know, inadvertent uh, removal of licenses, you're protected, your purchase rights are protected. And then the last one is save settings on the, sorry about my dog here, <laughs> save settings um, to the registry. Okay, there was one thing I wanted to touch, touch redo or rediscuss at just a moment. I want to, did you want to go to the part? Uh, yeah, if you want to quickly show the license dialog, I want to show them where the IP is set up. So the options, yeah, go to the licensing. Uh, so here, if you notice the network lock license service settings in each client, uh, that checkbox needs to be checked. And then the same IP address of where the server is running needs to be input uh, as well as the port. Uh, so the port number is what, uh, the port is what is used to communicate with that server, uh, service that's running on the server. So yeah, these two have to match up. That's how the communication handshake is done. So yeah, that's all I wanted to show. Okay, I just wanted to touch base just a, just a moment on something that we kind of skimmed over real quick, but actually will benefit everyone, regardless of what configuration you're running. I want to go back to the post processor tab. Um, to the save post, um, this happens uh, a lot where the user will will contact support and say that you know my post was changed why why is my post different than I wanted it to be or that it was uh, with this file so previously there were conditions where uh, the default post um, may have replaced the post that was in the actual file when it was programmed a year ago or whatever okay so now you can use these two checkboxes to make sure that your post always stays uh, with the file. When you open a file, regardless of when it was done or what it, you know, whatever, the post that was used to cut that part is going to be used when you open it, and the same same as when you uh, save it. So I, I I just wanted to reiterate this a lot because this is a big deal and it can really help save you. Uh, some trouble and some misunderstanding down the road of, of why your post may have gotten changed uh, or replaced, let's put it that way. So that's very important uh, to implement. That's all I had. Okay, so there's a few other questions related to the product. When can I get the 2024 product? Uh, as I mentioned early on in the uh, presentation, it is available now for download. Uh, you can go to our website, or uh, if you're eligible for the 2024 product, you would have received a, li a license email from us saying that your license has been upgraded. And so in that email, you would have a, a link to the download page uh, that you can download the 2024 product. And yes, uh, uh, the Rhino Cam 2024 runs on Rhino 8 as well as Rhino 7. That was another question. It runs on both Rhino, but it does not run on Rhino 6. So you would need either Rhino 7 or Rhino 8, and the same license will work on both products. Yeah, and also we're, we're running Rhino 8, just for your information. Everything we've showed you is on Rhino 8. Okay, all right, great. And will, I'm on Active AMS. Uh, how do I get my upgraded license? Yes, your same license. If you're on Active AMS, your same license code will work on the new product. And... Uh, so it would have been upgraded by now, and all you had to do is go to the download page and follow the instructions on how to upgrade the product. So install the product. I would recommend releasing the license from the older version that you're running first. Make sure you do that, and then install the new 2024 product and then license it using the same license code. That would be the preferred procedure. Just don't forget uh, releasing it from the old product because otherwise it's going to be locked to the old product. 
Yes, and you can also go back and run both, right? If you needed to go back and run 23. Yes, the yeah. older version, uh, you could run uh, that product also, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, with the same license code. So. Okay. There was well, another question on, uh, can you set the always load post from file on file load as default check? Yes, we can do that. And defaults can be saved in a template files and any parameter that you want can be saved as the default that you want. And then uh, if you just want to show the default, uh, uh, not right here, right here, Don. What are the options where you oh. show the knowledge base defaults? Oh, okay. Yeah, the default machining operations, um, you can uh, save as a default knowledge base anything that you want saved. And then all, and always load it. Whenever you get a new uh, new session opens, it always loads it from that default uh, knowledge base. And that way, whatever operation or whatever parameters you, you want saved and used as defaults can be set. So it doesn't necessarily have to rely on our factory defaults. Uh -huh. Hope that answers the question. All right, we're right at nine. Uh, great, uh, thank you, Don. Thank you everybody for joining us. and. Um, and we will see you in future webinars. Take okay. care. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.